Bennett Goodman is uh, the founder of GSO Capital Partners, and he's a senior managing director at the Blackstone Group as well. Um, GSO is Blackstone cr Blackstone's credit investment platform. It has over $47 billion in alternative assets under management, um, which makes Mr. Goodman one of the most influential um, players in the world um, in terms of uh, the global credit scene. So please help me welcome. We're very happy to have him here, uh, Bennett Goodman. So maybe the first thing to do is to say, everyone here to say, happy birthday to Mr. Goodman. <laughs> today is celebrating his 33rd birthday, I believe. I um, wish. <laughs> long may it be 33. Yes. Um, so look, Bennett, um, it's great to have you here. A uh, couple, I just thought we'd just have a little free-form conversation, although we know what we're going to talk about in advance. Um, you know, it's, the, the first quarter ended, it was a pretty darn good first quarter. Uh, in, the, in the fixed income markets, I mean, in the markets generally. Um, maybe just you've got your, your fingers in a lot of different pies out there. What are you seeing now? And what's your sense of where we're going for this for the rest of the year? Sure. So uh, the first quarter was actually a remarkable uh, uh, performance for, I think, all of the public capital markets. Uh, the, the areas where we focus at GSO is really the leveraged finance markets, that non-investment grade, junk rated, uh, universal companies, double B rated, and below. And uh, those markets were up a lot, I think, in part because uh, Chairman Bernanke and his other central banking colleagues around the world uh, won, the, won the fight, and uh, investors kind of capitulated, and they moved out of cash into more risk-oriented assets, uh, desperately seeking some kind of yield. And high yield leverage loans were, were, were huge beneficiaries of that. I think that will continue, maybe not quite at the same pace, uh, primarily because the institutional marketplace is underweighted in this asset category. They own lots of equities and, and, and they're cutting that back. Uh, investment grade debt trades at uh, record highs, like you, I think the typical spread on a investment grade corporate, it's about 140 over treasuries, which is kind of the historical 30-year mean. And that's a 140 over, you know, a treasury that's about, you know, maybe two and a quarter. So you make a whopping 3.75% return. Uh, you, you know, you're not going to meet your actuarial assumptions there. So I do think uh, this whole uh, category of assets will continue to get a lot of flow and that will drive performance. Are you worried, I mean, is it, are people getting paid properly for the risks they're taking on? Huh. Well, uh, that, that's a good question. Uh, you know, it starts with treasuries, which I think are, you know, a horrible investment, quite frankly. Um, because of this uh, monetary policy that's being deployed throughout the U.S. and Europe, uh, treasuries are just too low. I mean, they are what they are. You can't fight it. But if you think that the 10-year should reflect the nominal growth rate of GDP plus a normalized rate of inflation, you probably should have a 10-year closer to 4% instead of 2 and a quarter. And at some point, uh, gravity will take effect. And, and when that happens, uh, you're going to see you know, quite a recalibration of, of, uh, of value. Uh, nonetheless, all fixed income markets are priced off of treasuries. Yeah. So when you say, are they getting paid sufficiently, I think in the public markets, it's pretty much run its course. And it's hard to argue that the leveraged loan market, the high yield bond market, I would, I would even say, you know, equities as well are not, you know, pretty fully valued. Um, but the, you can't say they're cheap by any, by any kind of uh, historical metric. All right, so given that backdrop of your view on the market, uh, talk about what GSO is, how you're finding opportunity, given the public markets are, you know, as you say, f fairly valued. Um, where do you, wh how are you, how are you making money? So to, to really create performance, I think in any investment activity where you have the size and scale that, that we do, you, you got to be a bit of a contrarian. So we take the perspective that the world is overpaying for liquidity. Everyone's still seared from their 08, 09 experience and they're paying more than they should for the privilege of liquidity. So we're spending all of our time on the less liquid strategies. Our mezzanine activities, our direct lending activities, our, our distressed investments, where we do have uh, more patient capital 
and those strategies can yield in excess of 500 basis points above what the public market comparable would indicate. And just to dimension that, uh, historically, if we got 200, 250 basis points more on a MES deal than the publicly traded high yield bond equivalent, we, you know, we probably would have been happy. Right. So we just think there's much better value as, as you, you move into the, uh, the less liquid space. But you have to have capital pools and investors that, that have the luxury of, of tying up their money for a longer period of time. So and let's talk about the different sort of products or, or avenues that people have at GSO. I mean, you've got, you just raised a $4 billion mezzanine fund, I saw. Yes. What else? I mean, how does, where does that play into this? So uh, mezzanine is really doing acquisition financing for buyout firms. Uh, that's what we, how we define the mezzanine opportunity. Uh, it, that is done out of a drawdown fund, private equity style fund. And uh, there, you know, our typical coupons are anywhere from 11% to 13%. More importantly, because we're the sole party negotiating the terms of these transactions, we have much safer capital structures than the public high yield bond market. Right. We don't have as much leverage on the balance sheet. We have less senior debt ahead of us than a typical high yield I bond. You don't allow a lot of sort of covenants to be stripped away. And we, we are, are rather uh, um, fussy, let's just say, about having yeah. some form of uh, covenant protection. Um, and, and it's just better than, than a public high yield bond. Yeah. But everyone focuses on, on return. We tend to focus also as much time on risk. And if we can have less risky capital structures by virtue of lower leverage, better covenants, that's just as important to us as getting a couple hundred basis points more in, in just the coupon. It must be kind of fun. I mean, your GSO is, is basically the credit arm of Blackstone. Now, you, were, you founded it. You were, an, you, you were independent. You sold to Blackstone. What's life like inside Blackstone when you, when, you know, you must, how, let me ask you, how do I put it delicately? How do you deal with the potential for conflicts that might arise from some of these, uh, from say investing in a, you know, a, I mean, you, you can be on the other side of the capital structure from a Blackstone fund, say. No need to be delicate. Uh, ask whatever, whatever, whatever you like. Um, well, one, there, there are a bunch of questions yeah. embedded in, 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 in that. Uh, one, life in Blackstone, uh, is very, very similar for GSO uh, as it was when we were independent. Uh, you know, quite frankly, 80% uh, of the GSO folks uh, all emigrated from old DLJ. And there's a fellow at Blackstone uh, who, who runs the place day to day, our president, Tony James, who was our boss at DLJ. So uh, any good idea we had at GSO, uh, honestly, we just copied from Tony. So our comp systems were the same. Our investment policies and processes were the same. Our, our review process of our people, promotions, it, it, pretty so, much identical so to the how cultural, Blackstone. Culturally, there was a fit. There. Yeah, and that made it, made it very, very easy. However, now we're part of Blackstone. They have a private equity group, and, and, and there is the potential for conflict. So if we are um, financing a MES deal and Blackstone's the sponsor, we have certain uh, procedures that we have to follow. One, we have to be a minority participant in the deal. Okay. So we'll call up Goldman Sachs or we'll call up another MES guy and say, okay, um, we have this gift for you. You can, you can finance this Weather Channel transaction. Uh, we're only going to take 25% of it. Um, we would expect you to reciprocate when you have a big deal and bring us in, um, which by the way has never happened with Goldman Sachs. I, <laughs> I don't think we're the only guys in that outcome, but, but um, that's uh, shocking because I, I heard it doesn't ever happen. No, nah, I know clients always the go New York first. Times and, um, <laughs> and, 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 and they're, they're a great firm yeah. and we love, we actually like working with them. We just never get the reciprocity. Um, <laughs> in addition, uh, no one from Blackstone's on any of our investment committees. No one's a key man. Uh, they understand that we have to act for the benefit of our limited partners, not their limited partners in the private equity group. Uh, I might add, our highest priority is our, our LPs, not, not the Blackstone shareholder, not the LP in a private equity fund. So it's actually kind of simple to right. follow the rule and uh, works out pretty well. We've done 40-some-odd um, MES deals 
in the course of the five years that we've been part of Blackstone, and uh, I would say three of them have been Blackstone affiliates. So it's not a very big focus of what we do. We tend to be financing smaller cap buyouts than what the Blackstones, the KKRs, the TPGs typically uh, participate in. Although, as we get bigger, that, you know, that, that might change. I mean, do you ever find yourself in a position where, say, uh, the sponsors bid for something and, and Blackstone may, not, may have lost to, uh, let's say, a KKR, and then you come in, is there any ill will born by the fact that you might then help finance the MES portion of um, that deal? Well, I'll give you a, a more poignant uh, case study. If we get a call from uh, TPG, just to pick a name, and they say, look, we're, we're thinking of taking this public company private, are you willing to work with us? Once we commit to TPG, we're, we're committed, we're exclusive, we can't work with anybody. Can't work with KKR or Apollo or even Blackstone. So we could be in a very awkward position publicly where we're backing TPG and uh, Goldman Sachs Mez is backing Blackstone. And that's just the, um, the way it has to be. We, we have to have that autonomy and we have to control our destiny. And uh, Blackstone knew that when they acquired us. Right. And we didn't have to point that out to them. They, they, they had already known that and they had operated a smaller mezzanine business. So that's not, that was not a new concept. We do have to keep all of our information confidential. So that's why no one from Blackstone's private equity group are on any of our investment committees. David Bonderman, theoretically, if we were doing a MES deal, doesn't want Steve Schwarzman reading his investment committee memo. So we do have a separate uh, compliance and legal structure. Uh, and we don't pass that information along sure. to anybody outside of our group. We've been doing this, you know, for five years, and, and I think the world understands how we operate, and our integrity is the most important asset we have. So, you know, we're not going to want to compromise. Um, no, and, and as you said, your, your LPs have to be absolutely sure that the first concern you have is for the returns on those funds. That absolutely. Um, what, I mean, what are the advantages then to being part of a, a big uh, asset management? There, there are actually a, a lot of advantages of being part of a, just a bigger firm. One, there, there are many times when a company might come to Blackstone's private equity group and say, gee, we're not going to sell you control because we don't want to be run by some 32-year-old kid, but we don't mind you investing $500 million and having a minority stake and you can go on our board, but you know, we're not going to give you control. Many of those situations uh, will be referred to us because the private equity guys want control They'll say, well, that's really what you want. You should think about doing a MES deal and give GSO a call. And our, our most recent MES deal for uh, EMI publishing was just that very fact pattern. Um, uh, Sony is acquiring EMI in an off-balance sheet structure. They were looking for a minor several minority partners to get them down below 50% of the equity so they wouldn't have to consolidate the billion and a half of debt onto their balance sheet. Um, they had a history with uh, some of our partners in the private equity group and then uh, they converted that into uh, a referral for us and we wound up investing approximately $400 million in a very attractive deal. That's about as good as it gets uh, in terms of synergy. We have clearly benefited by having many of the Blackstone LPs cross-pollinate into our funds. So we wouldn't have been able to grow our, our so business. So you get a capital introduction of some sort. Is yeah. That, and, you know, there's a lot of goodwill. And, 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 and Blackstone, I think, is held in you know, pretty high regard among, among the LPs. Not every LP, but certainly enough that allowed us to get to scale far faster than we possibly could have. And then third benefit is it's a, any global firm just has lots of different uh, data points to which, you know, you can tap into. So... I don't think anyone at GSO is so much smarter than any of our competitors, but I do think we have more information on different industries, on the regulatory environment, on um, you know, what's happening with currencies, uh, what's, uh, what are the central bankers in Europe thinking about in terms of the euro, which clearly has an impact on how we make investment decisions. And having access to that, I do think, is significant. We just have more data points 
with which to make judgments. Right. And it outweighs the potential conflicts. In that yeah. Sense. yeah. What, um, let's talk about opportunities, just going back. You, you, Europe, you mentioned Europe. I mean, first of all, looking, looking at the whole, the, the, the broad global credit picture, we, the, the, it seems the worries have dissipated. But you also see opportunity. Why don't we talk a little bit about what sure. you see in, in the European credit markets? So uh, the financial markets are you know, relieved that Greece didn't have this unstructured default. Our opinion is that uh, nothing's really changed. In two years' time, Greece will be back asking the ECB uh, for more liquidity. Um, and we just don't see how they're going to cut their way into prosperity. And they don't really manufacture a product or produce a service that the world wants to buy. Yogurt. Cement. There's not enough yogurt or olive oil to sell to make that budget deficit get below 120% of GDP. Um, and a devaluation would have worked, in our humble opinion, except there was no legal mechanism to do that. And I just don't think Germany wanted to stomach the potential uh, contagion that could have resulted in Portugal, which then could have taken down Spain, which then could have taken down Italy. And actually, Italy, that's the key. Uh, Greece, Portugal, add them up, multiply by two, they're not big enough to cause any damage. I'd argue Spain, you threw them in the mix, not big enough, but Italy is big. That's the Bank of America. Uh, yeah. Okay, we'll go with that. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> uh, um, so I just think Germany and France really just wanted to buy some time, and this was politically expedient, um, but it's no fix. And as a consequence, we're going to see a lot of volatility in the markets, particularly coming out of Europe, because every once in a while, the world will focus on the fact that nothing is really changed. Um, Europe has a banking system that's much more impaired than the United States. One, the banks are much bigger as a percentage of any host nation's GDP than anything like the United States. You're talking three, four, five times the size in France and Germany, for example, their banking system as a percentage of their economy. So, these are big problems, and it's going to take a long time for them to work down their balance sheets. Two, they're not only big, these European banks are still over-levered. Typical U.S. bank has about 10 times leverage today, down from about 30 before the Lehman crisis. We don't even know what the European banks were operating at back then. We guess 40 to 50 times leverage, but they've only worked it down to 20 times. So they're twice as levered. In addition, tier one capital is around 4% for the major European banks. It's twice that in the United States. So it's going to take a longer time for these banks to, to get their footing and to generate enough return on equity to justify a stock price above tangible book value. And today, they trade at, at, at a discount to tangible book. So, we're focused on trying to find those companies in those countries that have a good business model, but just too much leverage. And Northern Europe uh, has a trade surplus. Uh, there are many global businesses, uh, but they just have too much leverage. So those are good places for us to, to hunt. And we can dimension the impact of, of too much leverage uh, if it's a cyclical company, we can figure out and quantify how much liquidity they might need in order to get through the cycle. Um, it, what we can't dimension or quantify is like a turnaround of a Spanish uh, retail business. Uh, it's just unquantifiable to us. So there are many, many fine companies uh, in the UK, uh, in France, in, in, in France, Germany, the Netherlands, uh, the whole Baltic region. Uh, we actually like uh, a number of different companies uh, in Ireland, uh, which, by the way, has a trade sur surplus and a fairly well-defined pharmaceutical and technology industry. Right. Um, so uh, it really depends on the country, it depends on the industry and, and the particular company, but there's a lot more to do in Europe. But essentially, what, I mean, is, is, the, is the, the broader picture is you have the banks that you've painted this picture of banks that are over leveraged, uh, don't have enough tier one capital. Um, the, the, as a consequence, they're going to pull back 
essentially, reserve capital, well, reserve, keep the money back so they can get their capital uh, ratios up. As a result, they will be underserved customers. Um, meanwhile, you have these customers that have got financing issues. Yes. So essentially, you're acting as a, as a bank. Well, we're I mean, certainly, direct lending. Yeah, vehicle. absolutely. We, you know, we're trying to fill the void of those banks who used to provide capital. So in Europe, just to compare it to the United States, there is no mutual fund community in the leveraged finance asset class. In the U.S., we have Fidelity, Putnam, T. Rowe Price. We have these huge ETFs, and they represent about 65% of the new money coming into the market during this first quarter of right. 2012. None of that exists in Europe. The buyer of the syndicated loan was typically a, a bank. And it might have been a bank in Spain or it could have been a bank in Italy. They're going to definitely take their capital and bring it back on shore. Yeah. And we're going to see a lot more parochialism within the, within the EU. And even within uh, the northern European countries, those banks have to delever, as you suggest. And when the debt comes due in 2013, 14, 15, they're not going to re-up extend the way they have in the past. So we're definitely making the bet that there'll be many companies that need capital. It's going to be hard for them to get it. And what we're trying to do is identify those companies today. We actually have a, a target list of about 80 different companies that we've had conversations with that we know have big debt maturities coming due. Um, the bank market isn't big enough to absorb it. And we're, we're hoping to be able to, to infuse some capital uh, to help them refinance. What is that? I wonder what that conversation is like when you sort of walk into some Mittelstand company and say, uh, Guten Tag, you know, Herr Schmidt, um, I'm, you, you've been working with Deutsche Bank, which I noticed in one of your presentations has a, a 2% uh, tier one capital to assets. Um, you say, um, and they say, but I've been working with Deutsche Bank, the guy down the corner in, here in Dortmund. Um, why would I? Well, I'm Blackstone, I mean, what, yeah. GSO or what? You know, how, do you, how do you broach that conversation? Well, the first thing we say is, hi, we're GSO Blackstone and we come in peace. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was someone in Germany who, who described the private equity industry as like the locusts. Locus. It was uh, not just somebody, it was a minister. <laughs> okay, well, 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 there you go. Um, one of the things that you'll find shocking is if you look at the balance sheets of these middle stunt companies, they're all, they're all leveraged buyouts. They all have four or five times leverage. Without ever doing a leverage buyout. Without even doing a leverage buyout. And we love these kind of companies because they, you know, they, they're comfortable yeah. with the leverage. But they have been able to borrow extensively, extensively from the Landis banks. At and, low rates. At I very imagine. low rates. It's more of a relationship type loan. And now, uh, you know, the rules are changing. So the regulatory pressures are such that uh, at a minimum, you know, these banks are going to have to re-up at, at more market-type levels, um, and they probably aren't going to be able to extend quite as much. So if, they, if, if a German company can get local financing at terms well below what we're willing to lend at, God bless. Of There's nothing, nothing we can do about it. Uh, but they are interested to hear what we have to say, and they don't shoo us away as they might have uh, four or five years ago. What about distressed investing? I mean, if given the, the backdrop for, I mean, if QE3 is done, or whatever you call it, QE whatever around the world, has actually brought uh, people into riskier assets, um, it seems to be having somewhat of an effect on the economy, certainly in the United States. Um, how, so distressed investing, which I imagine is a very uh, high return business amongst, amongst all, the, all of your different products, um, where does your sense of where that's going to go in the next cycle. <clears throat> so uh, distress is definitely more risky and we try to target 20 percent gross returns in that uh, endeavor. And I think Europe is, is a little tricky uh, in that there's going to be a recession in Europe. The, the main issue is just how acute. Is it going to be flat? Is it going to be down 2 percent? Is it going to be down more? And I think that's a very regional uh, country by country type, type analysis. Uh, on, on, the, on the other hand, um, because there's just less competition, uh, we, we see more. And you need to be discriminating. Um, you need to um, 
understand creditors' rights, and it's not one integrated market in Europe. You know, uh, the bankruptcy code in France is very different than the bankruptcy code in the UK. And uh, while they're all democracies, uh, in France in particular, uh, they're more socialistic when it comes to creditors' rights, so we're, we're far less active in France because we can't, you if there's ever protection. a problem, we can't perfect our liens, we can't pursue our remedies. You'd be like a, a Chrysler. Uh, well, you know, holder. there's a lot more politics that, that right. goes into it, you know, in France. So our distress activities really only uh, deploy capital in those countries that have case law, they have a bankruptcy code, and, and you know, we're comfortable that, you know, we, we can manage our destiny through these processes. Mm -hmm. uh, we try very hard to be at the end of the process as opposed to the beginning of the process. So we're more focused on how can we help take a company out of bankruptcy so we don't have any of those vagaries impacting us. Being the first dollars in as you're going into bankruptcy, even though you're buying something at a low price, isn't necessarily our cup of tea because it just takes so long to get out. You don't you don't know how much more money you're going to have to put up, um, and it's just more challenging. So we're, we're more focused on trying to help companies either avoid a default uh, so that they don't go into bankruptcy, or we're working with companies that have already gone bankrupt. The banks have taken over control, and we're buying the paper from the banks who really don't want to own and control these companies. And we're, we're calling the workout groups and you know, trying to figure out a way to structure a deal that allows the banks to continue to have some upside if we're right in the investment because they're going to wind up taking a loss no matter what. Uh, we just recently uh, completed a deal for a UK home builder where RBS was the lead lender, the incumbent lender when the company went bankrupt. We were willing to put dollars into the company if the banks wrote off some of the debt that they held but in return for writing off the debt, we gave them 15% of the equity. Right. And um, we just closed that transaction last week. And you know, most of you might think we're totally insane investing in a UK home builder. Uh, but this entity will be unlevered, has no debt. It throws off free cash flow. The UK happens to be more landlocked than the United States. So Phoenix can grow and grow and grow and grow as it expands into the desert. UK has got a different dynamic. Yeah, Land's more scarce. And without any pickup in the current um, uh, business, you know, we, we can get to our 20 plus percent IRRs. If there is any pickup, and it might take a, you know, two, three, four years, uh, you know, we can make three, four, five times our money. And the banks know that. So the whole key to that deal was giving them enough upside so that they can get another bite of the apple uh, if and when that happens. And that's more of a classic. Uh, distress loan right. to own type deal that we're trying to pursue right. in Europe. Okay, we've time for one last question and it's going to be from me. And that is the, the topic du jour, of course, uh, uh, Mitt Romney won three, well, two, two and a half states, I don't know what you call it, District of Columbia. Um, and uh, everyone, well, there's been a, quite a bit of discussion here about uh, Romney versus Obama um, face off and the impact that it will have on the private equity, alternative assets, let's say, uh, industry broadly. What's, uh, how do you prep for it? Well, um, in terms of the public image that, the, the, yeah, of the, of the uh, good question. I, I mean, we, we think we, you know, you, ha you ain't seen nothing yet <laughs> in terms of the bashing of the private equity industry. And I'm sure the uh, Obama administration is out interviewing laid off workers and, you know, the, the mechanic who, you know, uh, worked at uh, Ampad, which was a Bain buyout that went bankrupt, and you know they're building their 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 case files that they're going to unleash. Well, the Republicans, to be fair, did it for them earlier in the primary. They did. They <laughs> certainly opened Newt up Gingrich the. Uh, made that very clear. Uh, uh, so you know we we just think there'll be be a lot more. Um, you know we're trying to get the facts out. I think uh, private equity has a real raison d'etre to exist. I don't, I don't believe private equity firms go in to fire people and shrink businesses. Uh, I really do believe it, it is a very advantageous uh, investment strategy to help companies uh, grow, to, to improve employment. Uh, in today's cycle of private equity, um, you know, the deals aren't, aren't set up to 
uh, strip the assets out and fire a bunch of people and flip it. Uh, the, the, the value added of private equity today is to work with the management teams from an operating perspective to improve their business, to introduce new products, to expand their, uh, the geographies in which they compete, to make them more efficient uh, so they can get a higher multiple. Right. Um, and I think the industry needs to do a better job of articulating uh, how they do that. And it's not going to be simple because not every deal follows that formula. Right. Uh, but the industry as a whole, you know, hasn't done a very good job, in my estimation, of uh, describing that uh, value-added proposition. And if you don't control the narratives, somebody else will. It's a lot easier focusing on all the negatives, and the industry needs to kind of figure out how to get some of those positives out there. And you know, the one thing we we don't do is uh, enough of is you know we highlight the fact that we're, you know we're helping these union workers with their retirements. And I think private equity and all the alternative investment strategies pl play a very important role in fulfilling the promise that were made to all these public employees and the corporate workers as well, uh, not just to provide them with um, uh, you know, a pension, but also to give them the health care benefits that they signed up for. And uh, they're not, these pension plans aren't going to make it by buying high yield bonds no. in the public market. So they got to do some other things, and that's where these alternative strategies come, come to fore. Thank you, Bennett Goodman. Happy birthday, and uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Good. Thank you.